Hi, um, welcome to Relationship Masterclass. Um, this is Saint. The class I'm about to listen to is the biblical concept of divorce and separation. So I really want you to listen up to the end, up to the end, please, before you make a rash uh, conclusion and everything is going to be explained using the scriptures and the Bible. Not my opinion at all. The scriptures, the scriptures and the Bible. We'll let the Bible do the talking and I'm sure you'll be blessed. This course, understand I'm preventing divorce. At the end of this course, we should be able to um, understand what divorce is. <laughs> but basically, is to end the confusion about divorce. You know, it's a, it's a big subject in the body of Christ. Okay, so divorce actually a combination of two words. Die and voice. Die and voice. Die, like you know, means two. Voice is force. V O R C. Voice is force. F O R C. So, and when you divorce, you have two opposing forces pulling themselves apart in opposite directions. Two opposing forces pulling themselves apart in opposite directions. So that's what divorce is. So usually an outcome of mental deficiencies, so to say. Because whenever you see divorce, is a result of some emotional breakdown that got them to that point of making that decision to stay apart from each other. There's a big difference between divorce and separation. So in this course, we're going to look at it well in depth. You know, in the Old Testament, Moses introduced divorce. In the New Testament, Paul introduced separation because he had he had a full understanding of God's stance when it comes to that. He had a good understanding of God's stance point as regard as regarding divorce, he knew that God, from day one, did not like divorce. So he introduced separation. So like I keep saying, anytime I teach this course, and I want everybody that is listening to me to know this for sure, that divorce was never, never instituted by God. Never. It should be clear to you. You should have no confusions about it. Never God's idea. Divorce was man's idea. You know, at the, at, throughout this course, I would, uh, you will get to understand it. Divorce was man's idea. Because if it was God's idea, God should say that, God shouldn't have said that he hated divorce. We're going to get to the scriptures where he said that. But, he permitted it. So, we're going to look at all that. It's, it's an interesting study. So, we're going to let the Bible do the talking. We're going to let the Bible do the talking. Throughout this course, I will never give you my own idea. I'm going to let the Bible do the talking then. You now make the choice yourself. So let's start. First, we need to go to the origin of divorce. The origin. And the origin, of course, is in Deuteronomy. Moses, like I said, was when I introduced it. Deuteronomy 24. All right. So when a man had taken a wife, and married her and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he had found some uncleanness in her so you know that uncleanness and I said then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house she may go and be another man's wife and if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her and send her out of his house or if the latter husband die which took her to be his wife a former husband which sent her away may not take her again to his wife after that she is defiled for that is abomination before God, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which God hath given you for an inheritance. So, 
we're going to critically look at these four verses before we move on. And um, you remember our law of first mention. You know, I talked to you about the law of first mention. The law of first mention states that anywhere something was introduced in the Bible for the first time, surrounding it is the reason behind the introduction. So this is the first place divorce was mentioned and introduced in the Bible. So if you look around, it's still in that first verse. You're going to find out the reason why divorce was given. First, verse 1. So when a man had taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that he found no favor in his eyes because he had found some uncleanness in her. So there clearly you can see the reason for divorce clearly stated. The woman lost favor. So that means what is about to be said is actually the true reason why Moses allowed divorce. Now in this place, the Old Testament, the Bible says, because he had found some uncleanness. Some uncleanness. Please know that. And as we go on this study, we're going to discover what exactly this uncleanness is. You know, so because he has found an uncleanness. He now said, he should write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand. Let me also say something here. Remember, don't crucify me. Everything I'm teaching is strictly based on the word. Let me also say something here. Not my opinion, but God's words, you know, gives us an idea of this statement I'm about to make. Now, you notice throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, you know, as regarding divorce, throughout the Bible, it is the man that divorces, not the woman. Now, I know presently in our society, women can divorce. I don't have any problem about that. A woman can, a woman can divorce if, you know, the condition given in the scriptures, which I'm going to talk about later, is in place. I don't have any problem about that. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible just made it clear that it is the man that divorces. You won't find the Bible where they say a woman discovered uncleanness and she writes a bill of divorcement and divorces her husband. It is not in the Bible. Just want us to get that clear first. So, the reason for divorce based on the law of first mention is uncleanness. So, let's get that clear. Very clear. Uncleanness is the only reason given in the scripture for divorce. Now, verse 2. And when she departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. No issues with that. Meaning, once you divorce, the second point I want us to make, or the third point, if you take that point about only the man can divorce as the second one. So the third one is, she can remarry. Once you divorce, you can remarry. Biblically stated. So the Bible says that she leaves because she has been divorced by the husband. She goes, another man fancies her. She gets married to this man. And peradventure, in this her second marriage, the husband also finds something wrong and also writes her a bill of divorcement. And she's now divorced the second time. The second time. Verse 4. Now talks about the fourth point I want to make. The Bible says, Her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. That's the fourth point I want to make. Once you divorce from a man, you cannot remarry that man again. Not me. That's the scripture. You cannot remarry that person again. You, know, you see that happen a lot of times in the world. People that have been previously divorced will come back together and they will remarry. From the scriptures, not me, the scripture said, you cannot remarry. And God gave the reason why he said that. He said, so there will not be any kind of abomination over the land. And whenever the Bible talks about abomination, it's really in the Old Testament. It's really in the Old Testament. Time will fail me to show you scriptures like this. When we talk about abomination to the land and you should not do some certain things, it's usually because of the prevalence of some demonic activity. So demonic activity, some sins, if, if you commit in the Old Testament, the only verdict to handle that is death. Why death? Because in the Old Testament, um, we've not been given, in the Old Testament, we've not been given the power to cast out devils. So devils had a I don't know how to put it. They had a free for all, you know, affair. They could play. I mean, the, the devils had, you know, leeway to 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 do whatever they want to do. 
they had a free will. That was why when Jesus appeared, I was the first man to start casting out devils. You know, the devils were so afraid. The Bible said that when they see Jesus, they'll be shaken. They have not said anything. They are wondering, are you casting us out? Are you sending us to hell and all that? They are shaking because they, for the first time in about 4,000 years, a man walked on earth that had power over devils. And it wasn't like that in the Old Testament. That was why anything that had to do with demonic activity, the only measure that was prescribed was death. The Bible says, stone him to death. Stone her to death. Because they don't want the spread of that devil or the demons across the Holy Land of Israel and amongst God's people. But it's not so now in the New Testament. That is the Old Testament. I'm just making that point so you understand why God put this instruction not to remarry. You know, because of this. Because of the demonic activity. So they will not defile the land. So we've got all four points out of this now. So the question is, is it God that gave the instruction or is it man, which is Moses, that gave the instruction? So I said, so people say that it's God, it's a permitted, God gave the instruction. But I and I, and I usually take them back to Malachi chapter 2. As the, the Old Testament was ending, God in Malachi chapter 2 made some profound statements. Malachi 2 verse 14. Yet he said, We are for because the Lord had been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou had dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Verse 15. And did he did and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and every one that he might seek a godly seed, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hated putting away. This is the end of the, of the Old Testament. And God is making it clear. So the Lord God saith that he hated putting away. The end of the New Testament. So if it was God that gave that law in Deuteronomy 24, why then is he at the end of the Old Testament saying that he hated putting away? Now we, we know that God is the same yesterday, today and forever and he changeth not. We also know that God's words are yea and amen. Probably there is no deviation, variance, no, no shadow of turning in God. So God cannot talk from two sides of his mouth. It's impossible. He can't say, okay, go ahead and divorce if you find uh, uncleanness. Then the next we say, no, I hate divorce. Then if God is like that, then we're going to have little problems being able to trust God because you never know where God stands. But it's not true. God is not like that. That tells me something. It, is not, it was not God that gave that instruction. It was Moses that gave that instruction. Another thing to know about the Bible is that every word or thing you read from the Bible all of it, we are not God's words directly. In the Bible, you see stories of men and women. And in those stories, those men and women say a lot of things. In the Bible, you see God's prophet also say a lot of things that were not words or instructions given to them directly by God. And at times, when they say some of those things, God honors it based on another scripture, which I'm going to read for you. Isaiah 44 verse 26 says something. Let me read verse 25 so you you know, okay, verse 24, so you know who is speaking. Thus so saith the Lord your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who only alone stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth by myself. So you know who is speaking here is God. Let's, let's jump to verse 26. Isaiah 44 verse 26 now says something. I'm reading from the ESV version. English standard version. See verse 26 said, He confirms the word of his servants and fulfills the counsel of his messengers. That scripture tells us that God confirms the words of his servants. God confirms things that they say that are in line with his will. In line with his will. I'm going to prove all that. So you might now say, okay, Pastor, if you are saying that God confirms things, that are in line with God's will, then it is, that means God supports divorce. No, that doesn't mean God supports divorce. I'll explain that. God allowed, allowed, permitted, permitted this instruction of Moses 
to kick in because of one thing. Now, for me to explain that well, we now need to move to the New Testament and let Jesus himself, the God, the Son of God, explain exactly what I'm trying to say by himself. So we're going to go to Matthew now. So we're going to go to Matthew 19. Let's hear from Jesus himself. No other person than Jesus can explain and balance this truth out for perfect understanding. So let's listen to Jesus carefully. So please join me. Let's listen to Jesus. Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, listen to that question. First, the Bible has given us the backstory, meaning that the Pharisees came to tempt Christ. And see how they framed that question. He said, Can we divorce our wife for any cause? For example, I don't feel love anymore for him. Can I go ahead and divorce him? Or we are no longer compatible. Can I go ahead and divorce him? Or the spark, the way it used to be at the beginning, we've lost it. Can I go ahead and divorce him? Or oh, we're having terrible financial issues. Can I go ahead and divorce him? Or he's beating me, he beats me blue black, meaning he physically abuses me, he verbally abuses me. Should I go ahead and divorce him? So the question there is, is it permitted for us to divorce our wives for every cause? Now let's listen to Jesus. Verse 4, Matthew 4, 19, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? Very important. Jesus answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? So what, what was Jesus doing here? Jesus was taking them back, back to the scripture. Still based on the law of first mention. Where was Jesus taking them to? Jesus was taking them back to creation and the first marriage. The way those things are supposed to operate are all contained where that thing, that issue was first mentioned. So Jesus took them back. So let's go back with him. He said that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. So first, from this now, Jesus is also making it clear that marriage is only between the male and the female. See the next thing he said, verse 5. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twine, meaning two of them, shall become one flesh. So the skin, another thing God, the other reason why God put that in Genesis chapter 2, that's where he's, he's quoting from. Two of them shall become one flesh. He's trying to state a fact too that if two people are supposed to be in one flesh, there should not be any separation. The only way you can separate one from the another, if they are in one flesh, is through death. Because if you try to remove one out of that flesh, the two of them will die. So you begin to understand why God said that at the beginning. The two shall be one flesh. Meaning God's original plan for marriage is that they cannot come apart. They can't. They have to be together. So you might ask, then why did they come apart? Also stated clearly in that place in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, to say that clearly, why the two of them came apart was just because man was alone. So the Bible said that God caused man to get into a deep sleep and he conducted the first surgery and pulled that in. But originally, they were all together in one body. You know, but God separated them. He knows how he did that. But anyway, so let's continue. Now see what he now said in verse 6. He said, wherefore, they are no more twine but one flesh. So Jesus took us back to the beginning. What was Jesus doing here? Jesus is trying to make it categorically clear that the original plan for marriage is that there should be no separations at all. That was what was in God's mind. His plan, his will, his desire is no separation. The two of them shall be one. You know. And see now what Jesus now said, which was not included in that place in Genesis chapter 2. So what Jesus was trying to say, he's trying to he's, he's, he's stamping it again, making it categorically clear that there should be no separation. That wasn't God's plan. So what Jesus now said, say, what therefore God had joined together, let no man, including the husband or the wife, or a side chick, 
or a side guy, whoever, family, friends, no one should put asunder. Jesus added something else. There's not in Genesis. Making assurance doubly sure that God's original plan for marriage is that no divorce. Clearly. So clear. Now see what they now said to him in verse 7. They now said unto him, Why then did Moses, I love this, why then did Moses, even the Pharisees, because they are also students, not even students, they are masters of the law. They knew that it was not God that gave that law about divorce. They knew it was Moses. If it was God, do you know what they would have said? They would have said, why then did God give us the permission, the law, to divorce our husband, our wives? So, they, because they are masters of the law, they knew the law, they knew the instruction, they knew that it wasn't God. So, this also buttresses the fact that I made earlier, divorce was not God's idea. Divorce was not instituted by God. Clearly stated in Matthew 19 verse 7 which the Pharisees that came to tempt Jesus actually knew about it. So say, why did Moses then command us to, to give a writing of divorcement and put it away? Now see what Jesus responded to them. Verse 8, Jesus said unto them, this is where originally when I talked about the reason why God endorsed that law given by Moses. See the reason now. Jesus gave us the reason clearly. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts suffered you Moses because of the hardness of your heart suffered you when you read that scripture in another translation I think the Bible said Moses because of the hardness of your heart permitted you the word suffered there means permitted 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 Meaning this was not a law because it, when the law, it when regarding laws, there are no permissions. Laws are commands. You obey them. If you don't, you suffer the consequences. But this was not a law from God. This was what Moses gave the people, and God, the Son Jesus here, made it clear to us the reason why. Say because Moses permitted you. Because of the hardness of your heart to put away your wife. So clearly, what we'll get from this point, from this verse is that number one, divorce was not an instruction or a law or a commandment given by God. It was given by Moses. And another thing you get from here is secondly, it was because of the hardness of their hearts. That was why they were permitted. So before we go ahead, we need to now understand what this hardness of heart means. What exactly is hardness of heart? We are going to go back to the scripture. Remember, we are looking at biblical stance point of divorce. Let's go to Ezekiel. I'll start reading from verse um, 25. Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Remember, what we're trying to you know, decipher is that word hardness. What does it mean? Verse 25 says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Verse 26. And a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will take out the stony heart of your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. So you can see here that this hardness of heart Jesus talked about was clearly depicted in this verse 26. That hardness of heart is the stony heart. When Jesus was talking about the stony heart, he was actually referring to the, the hardness of heart, rather. He was actually referring to their stony heart. So in this place, in, in Ezekiel 36, you can understand what is going on there. Is it, you know, literally a stony heart? No. He's talking about salvation there. See verse 26 again said, A new heart, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit. Now you understand what happened to us as salvation. Salvation is the recreation of our human spirit. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, do you know what really entered? It is the Holy Ghost that entered into your heart. That's why I said, A new spirit will I put within you. He said, I will take away the stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. So he said, I said, I will put my own spirit, my own spirit 
within you. So he's talking about salvation. So why Mo- Jesus was not telling us the reason why Moses gave them that instruction and the reason why God confirmed it. Because it's in line with this. Because God will not confirm anything he said that is not according to his law. So because these guys were not born again. And seeing what someone has not born and but these guys were not born again. And if you're not born again, you greatly lack the ability to love the way you ought to love. The Bible made it clear in Romans chapter 5. The Bible says that, that God has you know shared his love abroad within us. How did God do that? He said, by his spirit. So the Holy Ghost is also the spirit of love. That's why in, in Galatians, the fruit of the spirit started with love. So these Old Testament saints, we are not born again. So they were not really able. They didn't have the capacity. They didn't have the equipment of love, which is the Holy Ghost on their inside, for them to be able to overlook, tolerate, forgive whatever their wives might have done to them to avoid divorce. So they didn't have that capacity. And God knows they didn't have that capacity. So he permitted them to do that. When you discover that somebody doesn't have the capacity to do something, you can overlook some certain things. There's this popular video on the net. I don't know if you guys have seen that video. About a man sat in his car and needed his boots to be closed. He didn't close his boots. So he noticed from his dashboard that that he's from his dashboard that um, that uh, his boot was open. So a passerby came across. So he turned and said, please, can you help me close the boot? And the guy was like, what? Can't you just get out of your car and close your boot? Why are you asking me to help you close your boot? Is that an insult? Because you think I don't have a car because I'm on foot. You can't just come out and close the boot. And the guy was like, please. So the guy was, the person was so mad, wanted to walk out. Do you know what the guy did? The guy now opened the door and showed him that he was paralyzed. I think he didn't have... I think whether one he didn't like one of his legs was amputated or something. You know, do you know what then happened? The passerby now apologized to the man and now went and shot his boots properly. What just happened there? Before the passerby realized this man's condition, he was annoyed. He was vehement, he was really, really vehement, annoyed man. Why are you insulting me? Can't you just come up and close your boots? But when that passerby realized that the man in the car making that request was disabled, what did he now do? He apologized and now went and closed the boot. That is the same thing in this case. The Old Testament saints we are disabled. They didn't have the ability, the capacity to love. So because of that, when Moses gave that instruction, God did not counter it God did not say why God did not counter it God just kept his mouth shut and that scripture I read for you in Isaiah 44 verse 26 snap kicked in he confirmed the words of his servant and for you to also understand that Jesus that's why Jesus that's why Jesus talked about it in that place in Matthew he said see why Moses gave you that law and why God did not say anything about it is because of the hardness of your heart. That is also the reason why in the New Testament now, for believers that are saved, and that spirit of love, the Holy Ghost, has is now shared abroad in their hearts. That law that was permitted, the divorce law, it's no longer permissible. I put that in parenthesis. I'm going to come back to it. So we're going to go back to Jesus. Remember, he was still talking in Matthew in that Matthew chapter 19. So he said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses suffered. Moses permitted you, permitted you to put her away. You know, so we now understand what hardness of heart means. He was talking about their being unsaved. That's why God allowed that instruction to kick in. Because somebody that's unsaved doesn't have the spirit of love to be for, able to forgive. All right, let's move on. Now, see verse 9. Okay, see what he said. This is very important. He said, to put away your wives. He said, but from the beginning, it was not so. From the beginning, 
What does that mean? God's original plan. It was not so. It was not so. All right. Verse 9. I said, and he's still talking. I say unto you, whosoever put away his wife, except it be for fornication. That fornication was the uncleanness that Moses referred to in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. If a man's wife loses favor in the eyes of her husband because of uncleanness, if the man finds uncleanness, that word uncleanness is what Jesus is telling us what it is. It is fornication. What does that mean? The woman was unfaithful to the husband, to her husband. So unfaithfulness is seen as the only criteria for divorce. Unfaithfulness. Because when you are unfaithful to your spouse, you have literally broken the marriage covenant. So Jesus now said, except it be for uncleanness, which is fornication. I made it clear. Say, except it be for fornication. And shall marry another committed adultery. What was Jesus saying? First, there was no divorce from the beginning. Secondly, if anybody divorces his wife for any just cause, like the Pharisees asked him from the beginning, and they remarry, they are in adultery. They divorce because one person, because one person committed adultery or fornication. Then the divorce is okay. They can remarry. But if they divorce for any other cause, any other cause, remember biblically, any other cause includes verbal abuse, physical abuse, do you love anymore, you've lost your feelings, whatever other reason, apart from fornication, biblically, divorce is not permitted for that. But keep listening. I'm coming. I'm going to show you the solution to physical abuse and all that. So, you say that person that divorces except it be for fornication is committing adultery. Then, when the disciples heard this in verse 10, see what they said. He said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is then not good to marry. Do you know what's going on at this point in their lives? They were just divorcing for any just cause. They were divorcing for any reason. Whatever their wife would do or does, they just go ahead and divorce. That was exactly what was going on here. That was exactly what was going on here. The, 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 the disciples were like, Oh, really? Christ? It is our way. Then they should not marry. Just stay alone. Let's just go to this chapter 19 again because I might not come. I might not come to it again. I will just make reference to it. First, in verse 4, Jesus made it clear. In case you're taking notes. First, in verse 4, Jesus made it clear that divorce was not God's original plan. So it was also at the beginning. Two, he said, he made them male and female and put them in one body. So there was no way he could have separated them. Verse 5, and said, For this cause a man leave father and mother and cleave. That word cleave is like grafting. Grafting never to be loosened to his wife. He said the two of them shall be one flesh. So Jesus first stated God's original plan, which is no divorce, which I've already showed you in Malachi chapter 2. God himself screaming from the mountaintop, I hated divorce. All right. He now buttressed it by saying what God has joined together let no man put asunder. Now, see the next verse, verse 7. The Pharisees now asked him, Why then did Moses give us that commandment? So the next point is that it was Moses that gave the divorce law, not God. That should be clear. Verse 8. Jesus also responded to that question, said, From the beginning it was not so. He said that Moses permitted divorce only on one ground which is infidelity note that only on one ground god permitted that only on the ground of fornication which jesus made clear so jesus also made it clear that if you can remarry after divorcing outside this reason you are in adultery clearly stated so i want to leave with this point in your mind as you're about to step into the next level of this class. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions? That there is not all the words written in the Bible that are God's words. That some of them are man's words that God um, that sanctioned, emitted, that kind of a thing. Yeah. That was what you said. The Bible made it clear. The Bible made it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. 
Because what I, it's, I'm really feeling somehow because I've always known, I've always been taught that the Bible is God's word and it's this mm-hmm. yardstick. You know, Bible says in the beginning of was the word mm-hmm. and the word was recorded and the word was God. Mm-hmm. And that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one drop of his word shall not pass away. Mm-hmm. So, but now, and that the scriptures were inspired, like, okay, sorry, men of old were inspired to write scriptures. So, mm-hmm. it's actually God's word. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, how do I, it's your how do we um, resolve that? Okay, see so what I mean by that. The entire Bible, we are, what, they were all inspired by the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? Genesis was written by Moses. Moses was not alive throughout the period of Genesis. Everything he wrote in Genesis, he was not alive at all. So the question is, how did he write it? So God probably, while people, theologians spe- speculate that while he was, you know, on top of the mountain, either the first 40 or the second 40 days, God showed him like a movie, the entire Genesis. So he put it down. Do you understand? He put it down in writing. He was not alive. It's not like he recorded events while he was alive. Nobody was alive when the world was created or recreated. But possibly God showed it to him. He saw Adam, saw Eve and all that. So he now finally documented it. Like this place we now read, verse 1 in, in Matthew 19 says, that the Pharisees came to him, tempting him, and the Pharisees said unto him, Is it lawful for man to put away his wife for every cause? It is the Pharisees that spoke. What I mean that not every word in the Bible we are direct words from God, if you know what I mean. Not every word in the Bible we are direct words from God. So we are stories between men, stories of events. When God spoke in the Bible, you see with written, God said so, so and so, or somebody quoting what God has said, like Jesus did that a lot. In fact, all the all the New Testament, whenever they quoted the Bible, they were quoting the Old Testament because none of them read the New Testament. But they were inspired by God. When Moses gave that instruction, permitted them to divorce, it was an inspiration of God, which you know, like that I was trying to explain. I said. You know, that God confirmed the words of his servants and the counsels of his messengers. But if the words of his servants were outside his will and precepts, he will not confirm it. So, when Moses gave that instruction, he gave that instruction based on inspiration. If we only had the Old Testament, we would not have understood it. But Jesus explained it for us here. He said, see, why Moses permitted you guys is because is the hardness of your heart. So when Moses was giving that job based on inspiration, he was also thinking in line with the fact that these people, we are not saved. They didn't have the Holy Ghost on their inside. So they didn't have the capacity to love. Why then was divorce not ever talked about in the New Testament? Because now the Holy Ghost has been shed abroad in our hearts. The Holy Ghost has been released. That Holy Ghost has given us the capacity to love. To love. So when, even if you find, I was going to end with that yeah. Even if you find uncleanness in your wife or in your husband, love should kick in. And what will love do? Love should forgive. That is the point. So there's forgiveness. You honestly, you see that they really talk about forgiveness in the Old Testament. Not really, but it was in the 14th in the New Testament. The Old Testament is an eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. That's the Old Testament. Why did God give permit and give them all those rules? Because... They didn't have the capacity to love. But the New Testament, do what Jesus do they say, ah, now it's no longer eye for an eye. Then somebody slaps you, give you the second cheek to slap. Why did Jesus say that? Is he contradicting the Old Testament, which is an eye for an eye? No, he's introducing the New Testament, which is all about love. It's no longer about seeking vengeance for yourself. It's all about love. So what I mean by the word of, not every word in the Bible is the word of God is actually that not every word spoken came out from the word of the came out from God's mouth. Yeah, so the Bible is the word of the Lord, it's God's word. But not every word in the Bible is the word of the Lord. Do you understand? The entire Bible was breathed by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But not every word was directly spoken by God. That's what I meant. Men's words were also included. Oh, Jonathan said to David, those are men's words, man. It's not God's word. 
Oh, Paul said to Peter, those are men's word, not God's word. But the entire Bible was given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Even those men's words, we can still learn things from them. Like I've just, we're just learning, you know, the reason why God endorsed the word of Moses as regarding divorce. Okay, let's move to separation. Divorce is legal separation. Legal separation. And legal separation in the aspect of no coming back. Divorce is legal separation without, you know, because you can separate, but it's not divorce. But once you divorce, that separation becomes legal. Just to buttress this stuff again, Matthew 5. I know Matthew 5 was part of the Sermon of the Mount. Part of the Sermon of the Mount means Jesus also talking. And this was even before they came to ask him that question of divorce. Matthew 5, verse 31. Still Jesus speaking. It has been said, see Jesus speaking, it has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verse 32. But I say unto you, are you seeing the two, the difference? The previous one was the law that Moses gave. Now, he says, see, I, Jesus, say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery. So Jesus again is making it clear that the only ground for divorce is if there was fornication, infidelity involved. Alright, so now to separation. So in the New Testament now, Remember, uh, this place we just read in Matthew, though it is the section of the Bible called the New Testament, but in essence and reality, the New Testament hadn't done. The New Testament dawned after the death and resurrection of Christ and the unleashing of the Spirit of Grace, who also is the Spirit of Love, who is the Holy Ghost. So now in the New Testament, let's see God's standpoint. And I always say this categorically clear. I always say this categorically clear, that you will never find in the new dispensation in the new dispensation the dispensation of the holy ghost the new testament no reference was made no instruction no commandment was given regarding divorce because in the new testament now we are playing under different rules because in the new testament we are now equipped with that thing which the Old Testament saints lacked. And that thing is not actually a thing. That thing is a person. And this person is the Holy Ghost. He is the Spirit of grace. He is the Spirit of love. He has given us the capacity now to love. So putting away no longer stands. But in cases in marriage where things have gone so bad that a man can no longer live with his wife, a woman can no longer live with her husband. Paul introduced something which also was not introduced by God. We're going to read it now. You see, it's clearly defined. This was also introduced by Paul, but still under the inspiration of God, he introduced separation. So am I saying that stick it out even if your life is threatening your marriage? No, that's, that's what I'm saying. Once you feel your life is threatened, you can separate, but you cannot divorce. So let's look at it. First Corinthians chapter 7. So let's look at it. First Corinthians chapter 7. So the Corinthians church wrote to him. They asked him a question. This Paul responded to them. He said in verse 1, Now concerning the things therefore you wrote unto me, he said it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but he said nevertheless, for to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise also the wife to the husband. Verse 4. A wife had no power of her own body but the husband. And likewise the husband had no power of his own body but the wife. 
and he said deferring not one another except be for consent and he went on and on and on he also talked about what just was talking about, about the three kinds of enoch and all that now let's see where see where i want to start from verse 10 and unto the married i command yet not i okay i think i should just go up so you understand that's the point i want to bring out see that first verse verse uh, five do not defraud one another except if for a consent for a particular time and come together so certain not tempt you for your incontinence and i see verse six he said but i speak this by permission not of commandment this is very important to note paul is about to say some things he said see i speak this by permission not by commandment what he's trying to say so the next thing i'm about to tell you now is not a command from god no it is me that's about to say the following things i'm about to say if moses had done this in that Deuteronomy chapter 24 it would have solved a lot of problems he must have said at the beginning of verse 20, chapter 24 of uh Deuteronomy, what i'm about to say now it's me speaking no not god I'm going to say this now by permission, not of commandment. You can put away your wife if you find if um, uncleanness. We can be clear to everybody that God is not the author of author of um, divorce. But Paul, I like Paul, he made it clear when he was speaking based on the inspiration of the Holy Ghost still. He said, For I would that all men we are even as I myself. When every man has his own proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about when he talked about Enoch. When the disciples said, ah, if the case be like this now, then we need to marry. Then there's a third part Jesus talked about. This one's that he said, they were made Enochs by men. A good example of that is Daniel. Daniel was castrated. You know, they were made Enochs by men. So by Paul's case, is the case of, I believe he was perfect, but just did not have this thing about marriage it was just comfortable staying alone so when he was saying this i'm saying this by permission he said i wish all men were like like me as in they can do without this and remain unmarried you know that what he was saying there but when he was done saying that he said uh, if they cannot do, contain or hold themselves they should marry that is better you marry than to burn now verse 10 now says but unto the married i command the next thing he wants to say now has nothing to do with his own opinion He's stepping back to God's command. He said, I command. Now, for you to want to not to be doubtful about whose command it is, see the next thing he said. He said, Yet not I, but the Lord. So he's saying the clear demarcation. God, the Lord is commanding this now, not me, oh, the Lord. He said, What is the Lord saying? He said, Let not the wife depart from her husband. <laughs> Are you saying God's law? So in the New Testament, God's original plan still stands. In the New Testament. In the New Testament, God hated divorce. Clear. That's the New Testament. It still stands. He said, not I, but the Lord. If you're listening to me, you're wondering, this, this man is so hell-bent on divorce and all that, not divorcing. Still keep listening. I'm going to banish at the end. You know? He said, not I, but the Lord. So he's reinstating, re-emphasizing that God hates divorce. God was never for one day in support of divorce. It's very clear. He said, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, 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 and if she depart, you know, in the New Testament, women can actually depart, can separate. In the Old Testament, it was just the men that could divorce. In the New Testament now, women can live with their tired. So he said, if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Are you saying? So Paul introduced separation, still standing on God's original intent for marriage, which is no divorce. No divorce. When a woman gets tired, she can leave. A woman feels her life is threatened. She can live only on the grounds of separation, not divorce. So she can live. 
He now said, she has to remain unmarried. Or be reconciled to her husband. So, separation is for reconciliation. So, you separate. You guys will cool off. In the future, you can reconcile. But you have to remain unmarried. But he said she should remain. Remain unmarried. So what is he saying? You can separate definitely. You cannot do this anymore. Fine. Nobody says you must stay in that house. No. You want to leave. You are tired. Fine. God is not a wicked God. I tell you, you must stay. No. Leave. Your life is, at, is threatened. Fine. Leave. But remain on my. This is not my suggestion. This is not my word. I'm just showing you what the scripture said. Leave. And stay unmarried till the rapture or till your death. Then Paul now said, Or oh, go and seek reconciliation later. So that this is separation because it's also not allowed in the New Testament. Only one ground was divorced allowed and is still allowed in fidelity because when you break the covenant, the parties of the part of the covenant can now go their separate ways and do whatever they want. So once there is infidelity and it can be proved, then you can divorce. But outside infidelity, you cannot divorce, but you can separate and you remain unmarried for the rest of your life. Or you be you seek reconciliation. That is what Paul that is Paul introduced it. We can even go ahead. Verse 12. But to the rest, speak I, not the Lord. Are you seeing now? He's, he's leaving again the command. He's stepping into his own word. He said, the rest, speak I, not the Lord. This is Paul speaking. So what is Paul saying? If any brother, remember he's talking to believers, have a wife that believes not. What are you talking about? This couple got married as unbelievers. Along the line, one of them got married. Don't read this place and say, ah, so it means that one person in the church, a believer, can marry an unbeliever. No, Paul has made it clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that there is no concord between a believer and unbeliever. So that, that, that is not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here is talking about two unbelievers that got married as unbelievers. But along the line, the gospel reached one of them. In this first case, he said the gospel reached the man. So the man is a brother, but the woman is still an unbeliever. He said, see, in this case, see what he said. If it, any brother had a wife that believed not, and she be pleased to dwell with him. Okay, so this guy got born again. All our partying, all our drinking, all those things have stopped. All those reckless lifestyles have stopped because he's a believer. But fine, I still don't believe in his God. But I'm okay to dwell with him. We'll continue living. That's what he's saying. Since she's pleased to dwell with him, fine. Let him not put her away. What he's trying to say, don't divorce because of differences in religion. Don't divorce because you guys have different religious affiliation. Once, you know, both parties are pleased to dwell with each, other, with, with each other. Verse 13. And the woman who had an husband that believed not to the other cases. Now, along the line, these two unbelievers, the woman got saved, but the man still remains unsaved. See what he said. He said, if he, the husband, the unbelieving husband, is pleased to dwell with the believing wife, the Bible says, fine, she should not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. He said, Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So, in these cases, one is a believer, one is not. And they're okay to sleep with each other. Carry on living. No divorce. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving departs. This is clear. In all these cases of one believer and one unbeliever, it is clear that the that it is clear that the believer is not permitted to live. Very clear. Why the believer now has the Holy Ghost, who is the Spirit of Love. So once you have that Spirit of Love, you should be able to tolerate whatever goes on in your marriage. Very clear. But now said, okay, if the unbeliever wants to leave let's read on to see what paul says should happen remember it's still paul that unbeliever depart let him depart a brother 
or a sister is not under bondage in such cases where God has called us to peace. So this other this verse also has different interpretation. A school of thought says, in this case of one believer and an unbeliever, if the unbeliever cannot stay anymore and leaves, one school of thought says that this believer now that is left alone can go and remarry. And that's what Paul means when he said the believer is no longer under any bondage. Another school of thought says, look at the next thing Paul said after he said no longer any bondage. He said, but, 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 why but? He said, but God has called us to peace. So the second school of thought said, yes, let that person go, but go and seek reconciliation later. That is the second school of thought. But let's keep reading. Verse 17. But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord had called everyone, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. He said, Is any man called being is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So what people are saying here is that Paul is trying to say that the condition at which you meet God remain at that condition. This usually comes in the place of, you know, people ask, ah, polygamy. A man, when he was unsaved, had several wives along the line. He got born again. What should he do? Some pastors will say, ah, he should throw away the other wives. That the first wife is his real wife. You know, then the question is, is that what God will do? Even in the Bible, when you go back to the law, that's not my my my, my focus today. You know, the day I'll teach on that, I'll take it to the law. The Bible says, it says that when a man even divorces his wife, he still needs to pay alimony. Yeah, they call it today in our world, the, the, the modern day word is that for that is family support. He still needs to do family support. It's in the Bible. You pay alimony, you take care of your children, you do all those things. For the woman you've divorced and for her and for the children. For the children will bear your name, you even take care of them. So those people that say, ah, that the other wives are not his wife, so it's the first one, are not really correct. The man did all that in ignorance. Now he's saved. The way he met God, he should remain like that. That's what person is talking about. But as God has distributed to every man, as God has called every man, so let him walk. Let every man abide, abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So what a man should do, he has to retain those his wives, take care of them, treat them well, and know that he should not discard anyone. Twenty-seven. He said, "Art thou bound unto a wife?" Verse twenty-seven. "Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed." <laughs> so this verse twenty-seven. Now, you know. Now puts a small snag to the, the the group that says that what Paul meant by the believer is no longer any under any bondage in verse 15 is that the believer can go and and remarry. But and if thou marry, thou had not sin, and if a virgin marry, she had not sin, nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. Verse 39 now says something. The wife is bound by law as long as her husband liveth. He's summarizing everything now. Say so the man is the woman is bound by law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the law, meaning she has to marry a believer. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. You see, everything has been saying since that point is his own idea, but he's, he now made it clear that he's speaking under the conviction, revelation of the Spirit of God. So, what is that thing he's saying? He's still saying no divorce, but you can separate, but you don't remarry. The only, guarantee, the only stance point upon remarriage after divorce is if the divorce was 
carried out because because of infidelity the only reason why you should divorce is because of infidelity and no other reason you are verbally abused physically abused you're no longer being taken care of by your husband and all those other reasons are not reasons for divorce but they are good reason risk they are good reasons for separation but when you separate don't remarry this instruction is for believers not for unbelievers unbelievers can go ahead and divorce the Old Testament says we're unbelievers and they went ahead and divorced, no problem. But for believers, for believers, for believers, the only ground for divorce is, is infidelity. Only that, and it must be proven. After Paul's test is here in 1 Corinthians 7, he ended it by saying, no divorce. No divorce. The only ground upon which God recognizes divorce is death, which Paul stated clearly here. Say, if her husband is dead, then she's at liberty. The Bible says two or three witnesses. Let me give the second witness. Romans. Romans 7, see verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law had dominion over man, as long as he liveth. The law has dominion over man as long as he liveth. For which law are you talking about? You're talking about the law in this case of marriage, the law of marriage, the covenant. He said, For the wife, which is the woman, which had an husband, is bound by the law to her husband as long as as he lived this is new testament meanwhile this is paul who, that appears as if he was scattering the law because divorce do not divorce is not the law actually divorce do not divorce is is from god is not part of moses law moses law is actually divorce so those that preach that the law is taken away that means divorce has been taken away so we're going back to the law of god which is do not divorce do you get my point <laughs> you know do not divorce. Say, well, a woman which had a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lived. But if the husband be dead, say the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called adulteress. Clear in black and white in the New Testament. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she, she though she be married to another man. So, so though she married another man, she is free from that law. So, biblically speaking, you know, biblically speaking, from God's standpoint, God has made it clear that he hated divorce from Malachi chapter 2. But has permitted man to divorce based on fornication, infidelity. What is fornication and infidelity? That has already broken the covenant. So, either party is free to remarry. But every other case or reason why you should you want to leave your husband apart from infidelity, in the New Testament, Paul talked about separation your life is threatened from physical abuse you can separate and any other reason you can separate but it was made clear too in that place is first Corinthians 7 that if you separate you remain unmarried or seek reconciliation and he also made a case in that place in first Corinthians 7 about a case of an unbeliever and a believer the believer should not leave but if the unbeliever leaves the believer is no longer under any bondage but he should also seek peace. And at the end, Paul wrote in verse 32 of 1 Corinthians 7 that the standard is no divorce at all. The only ground for divorce is death. Once one person is dead, the other person is free to remarry. The, only ground for, the second ground for divorce is infidelity. Once one party is unfaithful to the other, the other party can go ahead and divorce and remarry. But after I've, I've, but I haven't said all of this. You begin to wonder why divorce was not tolerated in the New Testament. It's like I said earlier on, it's because of the presence now of the Holy Ghost in the heart of every believer. That Holy Ghost is the spirit of love. No matter what your, part, your partner might have done, your spouse might have done, your wife, your husband might have done, we now have the capacity to forgive. We now have the capacity to forgive and continue to become one but if you're tired of forgiving and you cannot stay anymore 
divorce is only permitted if infidelity can be proved. But while you're on that, remember that Jesus said that you should forgive 70 times 70. That day, my wife was discussing, she said that 70 times 70 is like God is speaking to a man and his wife. Not like he was speaking to the man and his wife, you remember it was the case of talking to the disciples, but as if, you know, 70 times 70, that husband and wives need that. Because we now have the capacity to do that. We should forgive. We should forgive. We should forgive. I want to talk more talk about forgiveness. You have to remember where you are coming from, where God picked you up from. You know, how you constantly wrong him, do the wrong things. You constantly sin. But you always have this faith and this confidence that when you go back to him, remorseful and repentant, that he will always forgive you. And that is God. That is Jesus, our husband. So as a husband, you're able to forgive your wife. As a wife, you're able to forgive your husband. Love now is the commandment of the New Testament. But Jesus said, now we have only one commandment that have replaced the law. Not like replaced, but you know, one commandment. You know, so that commandment is to love. But this commandment of love is twofold. It's to love your God with all your heart, your strength, everything in you. Then to love your neighbor, not as yourself. Because some of us can even be selfish to, to ourselves. But love your neighbor. Jesus said, love your neighbor as I, Jesus, have loved you. So how did Jesus love us? He loved us regardless of anything whatsoever we've done, will do. You know, he paid the price of our past sins, present sins, and future sins. That same way, a husband, a wife, should be able to forgive her husband, her, his wife, for whatever they've done. That is what love is all about. That is why God is not in support of divorce. But you can separate. So these are my final words. Hi. Thanks for watching to the end. Um, there's something I want to also point out to you as we wrap up this class. If you remember, the Bible talked about uh, the disciples. Or if you remember, the Bible also talked about when the Pharisees came to also try and tempt Jesus about uh, with a tempt Jesus with a question, and the question was like, "Say, if there's a, there was a certain man that got married, but um, didn't have a child, and the uh, second brother needed to marry his wife. The same thing happened, and um, that woman was handed down, I think, to like seven or eight brothers, and they posed the question to Christ and said." That had the resurrection, which of the men will this woman be married to? I know what Jesus said, that there is no marriage in heaven. And one of the reasons why Jesus said that is that, one of the reasons why Jesus said that is that, yes, as the body of Christ will be married to him. But the main reason is that death is the only condition for divorce. So once death occurs here on earth, that marriage is annulled. So death is God's original plan for bringing breakage in marriage death is god's original plan to annul a marriage death is god's original plan god's original plan for marriage dissolution god bless you God bless you. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and look at the other, other masterclasses on relationship that I have. And very soon I'm going to have masterclass on uh, success coming soon. So you make sure you hit me up. Subscribe to my channel so you get a notification whenever a new class is uploaded. God bless you.